mentioned that the shapes of molecules are important um, in terms of chemical and physical characteristics of the compounds. Um, so Lewis' theory is the basis for another theory called valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. So the first letters of those words, valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. So we usually pronounce this as Vesper, even though that's switching the order around, but it's too long to say valence shell electron pair repulsion theory all the time. So Vesper theory. This is based on the idea that electron groups repel each other. So what is an electron group? So th this is important. Each of these counts as one group. A lone pair of electrons. A single bond is one, one group. A double bond is one group. A triple bond is one group. So those are groups of electrons, not, not just pairs. We're talking about groups, electron groups. So we have repulsion between the electron groups. And that determines the geometry of the molecule. So let's look at carbon dioxide. Here's the Lewis structure for carbon dioxide. We look at the central atom, and we ask ourselves, how many electron groups are on the central atom? Well, here's a double bond. That's one group. And here's another double bond. There's two groups. So there's two electron groups on the central atom. Those are going to repel each other. They're going to try to get as far away from each other as possible. So think of carbon as the earth. And this is you. And this is your vile X significant other. Okay? You hate them. So you're, they're over here. You're going to go to the other side of the planet right? as far away as possible. You can't leave the planet. This group cannot leave the molecule, but it can be on the far opposite side of the carbon atom. Okay? So the electron groups are repelling each other. Here's a molecular model of that. Here's the carbon. Here's one electron group, and here's the other electron group. It's going to be on the opposite side of the carbon atom. That determines the shape of the molecule. So this shape is called linear because these atoms are in a line. The bond angle here is 180 degrees. Any questions? Let's look at H2CO. We did this Lewis structure earlier. Looking at the carbon, how many electron groups? A single bond counts as a group. A double bond counts as one group. And this other single bond counts as one group. <coughs> three groups. Well, how do three things get away from each other? Here we have the center atom and the three groups, and they're going to form a triangle. So this can be illustrated with balloons. So here we have two balloons. And I will tie these together. This is always much harder than it should be. my guys cooperate. Okay, so two groups getting away from each other. They're going to be on opposite sides of where the necks of the balloons are tied together. When I put a third group in there, that's going to force these guys to be a little closer together because they're going to be repelled by this other balloon. So three groups. Right? Now the angle is not 180 degrees anymore. And it doesn't look like this either, because that would squeeze, right? We'd have to can't just do that in the air. You'd have to squeeze them down like that. That's not how they're naturally going to go. They're going to form a triangle. They're going to get equally spaced away from each other. Stay. So three groups are going to form a triangle. 
120 degrees. And so this shape is called trigonal planar because it's a triangle and it's planar. It's in a plane. It's flat. If you look at it this way, all of those atoms lie in the same plane, the same two-dimensional space. <coughs> Let's look at CH4. So here's the Lewis structure for CH4. Kind of boring. There aren't even any lone pairs. How many electron groups in the central atom? Four. So four things getting away from each other. This is where it gets a little more difficult to visualize because we're not, we're not used to this particular shape. course would be easier if I did these ahead of time, but then you'd, you'd miss out on the fun of watching me struggle with the balloons. There we go. So this yellow balloon forces the orange balloons a little closer together. It's not working as well as it's supposed to. You get the idea. That's called a tetrahedron. It's a shape that we're not really familiar with. We don't encounter it that much um, in everyday life. This is an illustration of this shape. So there's an atom in the center, and it has four electron groups. They're going to spread around in three-dimensional space. The atom's not limited to two-dimensional space. So it'll, it'll spread around. The angles here are 109.5 degrees. It forms a tetrahedron. Um, another way to think of this would be it's like a um, triangular pyramid, but the word we use is tetrahedral. Tetra is a prefix that means four. So it's got four things. Tetrahedron, a geometric shape with four triangular faces. We're familiar with cubes. Cubes have six square faces. This is four triangular faces. So what about ammonia? Here's the Lewis structure for ammonia. How many electron groups around the nitrogen? I hear three, four. The lone pair. The lone pair is an electron group. So we have to count it. Single bond, double bond, triple bond, lone pair. Those each are one group. So there are four groups here. Four electron groups arrange themselves in a tetrahedral shape. The difference is that one of these is a lone pair. So I think of that as being like this yellow balloon. It's different than the others. A lone pair, though, is like a, a clear balloon. It's invisible. It's there. It's pushing the other balloons closer together. But when you describe the shape, you don't include the invisible ones. Um, we can use models to illustrate this as well. We're going to play with these models in lab today. So this is a ball and stick model of a tetrahedron. This would be methane. So it's a tetrahedron, and the ammonia, NH3, the electron groups do the same thing, but now one of those is a lone pair. So I'm just going to pull the little white ball off. That's the lone pair. Making that a lone pair doesn't really change what happens to those other atoms bonded there. But it does change how we describe the molecular shape because now there's just a pair of electrons up there. Remember, the electrons are really, really, really tiny. And so essentially that's invisible. And when we describe the shape of the molecule, we're just looking at the atoms and how they're arranged. So that molecular shape is like taking this tetrahedron and just erasing part of it. So we're just going to erase that. Like it just wasn't even there. And what we're left is this shape. So that's not a tetrahedron anymore. It came from a tetrahedron, but this is called a trigonal pyramid. So it's got a triangle at the base, and it rises into a pyramid. 
So the electron geometry, we're looking at the number of electron groups. And, and we get this tetrahedron because of this lone pair. When we look at the molecular geometry, we're looking at the arrangement of the atoms. So you find the electron geometry first, and then you mentally erase the lone pair without moving anything and describe what's left. It's a trigonal pyramid. Trigonal planar is flat. Trigonal pyramid is, rises up in the middle. Any questions? About water. There's the shape of water, H2O. Lewis structure. So there's two lone pairs on the, on the oxygen. So when we look at this to determine its shape, there are four groups, four electron groups. Two bonds and two lone pairs. Four groups will form this sort of geometry, a tetrahedral electron geometry. And then we mentally erase the lone pairs, and this is what's left. It's a bent structure. Isn't that fancy? All these other names, tetrahedral, trigonal, pyramid, bent. It works. So here's a table from your book that summarizes the different possibilities. Um, you can use this as a reference, but I don't recommend memorizing it, OK? Because I'm not going to give it to you on an exam. And if you invest a little bit of time thinking about balloons, um, it's, it's easy to just come up with this by talking in your head. So here's what the book says how to predict geometry. Draw a collect, correct Lewis structure. Determine the total number of electron groups around the central atom. Determine the number of bonding groups and the number of lone pairs. And then, this just slays me. Refer to table 10.1 to determine the electron geometry and molecular geometry. Well, I'm not going to give you that on a test, so that's not going to work out very well. So let's just cross that off. What, what from that table should we, should we know? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. So don't do that. So determine the electron and molecular geometries by considering how the electron groups can get as far away from each other as possible. <coughs> Think about the balloons. Okay, so let's, let's do an example of this. Now, on a test where you're asked to predict the shape, I'll give you the Lewis structure. I'll ask you to draw Lewis structures on a different problem. But here in lecture, we're going to practice our Lewis structures as we learn about geometries. So here we have um, a funny-looking molecule, right, CLNO. And I'm telling you that nitrogen is the central atom, because otherwise this would be really confusing. So nitrogen is going to go in the middle, and oxygen on one side, and chlorine on the other side. To do a Lewis structure, we need to know how many valence electrons we're dealing with. So chlorine has seven, because it's in group seven. Nitrogen has five, because it's in group five. And oxygen has six, because it's in group six. And so we get 18. 18 electrons. Uh, we need a bond between everything to connect everything. So I've got 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. I'm short electrons. We need to share some more. So I'm going to take a pair from the nitrogen and put them between um, the nitrogen and the oxygen that is missing some electrons. So I'll put those over here. Now here I've got um, an octet on chlorine, an octet on nitrogen, an octet on oxygen. Is this going to have resonance? So we, we have a single bond and a double bond. <coughs> But are they between equivalent elements? No, they aren't. You don't have the information needed to predict 
which one the double bond will go on, but they're not equivalent, so this would not have resonance. The nice thing about this is you can predict the correct molecular geometry even if you put the double bond in the wrong place. So it doesn't really matter in this situation. So here's a good enough Lewis structure. To predict the geometry, we look at the central atom and ask ourselves, how many electron groups? How many are there? Three. Three groups. Think about three balloons. What shape would three balloons tied together form? A triangular, planar arrangement, right? So I'm going to draw that. So something in the middle, and we've got one up here, and they're going to make a triangle, right? You can imagine that, right? Think about the balloons. What are the balloons going to do? So there are three electron groups. So this is the electron geometry, sometimes abbreviated EG. Electron geometry is trigonal planar. The good news for you is that the exams are multiple choice, and so um, if you think of it as a planar triangle or something, as long as you can recognize the correct choice among the answers, you're okay. You don't have to spell these or anything. So trigonal planar, but there's a lone pair. So you find the electron groups, how many, think about what the balloons would do, fix a picture of that in your mind and name it, then make anything that's a lone pair invisible. So I've got one lone pair, so I'm going to make one of these invisible. So I'm going to make this one invisible. You can pick any of them. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. That one's invisible. It's still there. We just can't see it. And then describe what's left. What shape is that? Bent. So the molecular geometry is bent. You don't need the table to figure that out. You need to think about the balloons. You need a good Lewis structure. Identify the electron groups. Think about how ma that many balloons would get away from each other if they were tied together. If there's lone pairs, make them invisible and describe what's left. What that Molecular geometry. So sometimes the electron geometry and the molecular geometry will be the same if there are no lone pairs. It's only if there's lone pairs that they're different. Let's do another one. Predict the molecular geometry of the sulfite ion. So first of all, we need the, the Lewis structure. So I'm going to put the sulfur in the middle and put the three oxygens around it. And we have to think about how many valence electrons. Well, sulfur has six, and we have three oxygens, and they each have six. So that's 24. But then there's this charge. Do I add or subtract two? Add two. Plus two, so I've got 26 electrons to deal with. Make single bonds, two, four, six, and then start with the electrons. 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26. I had enough to make octets for everybody without doing multiple bonds. The only time you make multiple bonds is if you run out of electrons. I need to put brackets around this and a charge. There's my Lewis structure. On a test, I'd give you the Lewis structure and then ask you to tell me what the electron geometry and molecular geometry are. How many electron groups around the sulfur atom? Four. Three single bonds and one lone pair. Each counts as one group. So four groups. What shape do four groups make? Tetrahedron. So there's a tetrahedron. That's this shape. 
Okay. Tetrahedron. Then you have to, that's the um, molecular, uh, sorry, electron geometry. So electron geometry, tetrahedral. Molecular geometry, we have to look and see, are any of those groups lone pairs? Yes. One of them's a lone pair. So then I want to take and erase one of these and describe what's left. So here I'm taking this ball off my ball and stick model. What's left? Well, it's trigonal, but it's not flat. It's a pyramid. So trigonal pyramid or trigonal pyramidal as an adjective. So the molecular geometry is trigonal pyramidal. It is a trigonal pyramid. Any questions? So the ones that you will need to do, there could be two electron groups, there could be three, there could be four. Two is linear, three is trigonal planar, four is tetrahedral. Then you could have varying numbers of lone pairs. Erase those from your picture, either mental or physically drawn, and describe what's left. You could end up with something that's bent, or you could get a trigonal pyramid. Um, as is, those are pretty much the only options with lone pairs. Okay, so you don't really need the table. Use the table to check yourself, but think about the balloons. Any, any other questions? Okay, so chemists end up trying to represent three-dimensional things um, pretty frequently. This tetrahedral shape is really, really common, and it is a bit challenging to draw. So um, this is how your book explains it, um, and I think some of this is pretty lame, but whatever. So what we do is, if there's a straight line, we understand that that is in the plane of the paper or the screen or the board or whatever you're working on. If you have a hashed line, this is like kind of like a dotted line, that's behind the paper. You can't really see it, it's, that's why it's dotted. So that's going behind, and a solid wedge is sticking out at you. So here are the book's descriptions or, or uh, representations of the major molecular geometries. So linear, trigonal planar, and bent are pretty easy because they're two-dimensional, so you can draw them. Not a problem. These guys are three-dimensional. And so what we're seeing here is that these two are in the plane of the paper. This one is behind, and this one's in front. I draw it a little differently. Um, I would put, let's see, I'd put A here, and I'd put X up there and X down here. Those are in the plane of the paper, and I'd put this one coming out at me jump out and get you, and then this one is going behind. I always draw it in this orientation because that's what makes sense to me. I am not expecting great artwork out of you, but I do expect you to be able to look at these and have a clue as to what we're trying to convey. This is a three-dimensional thing. This is three-dimensional. It's not flat. 